All right, question of the day. Is it just a cheap and shameless way to get comments in the videos? Maybe, but I do like to hear from you and I like to respond to all the comments. So question of the day today is what is your favorite game of 2022? Now, Carl and I just did a 2022 top 10 that was on the Dice Tower uh, Winter Spectacular, which we were going to be in person, but couldn't be there. Uh, unfortunately, but also thankfully because we were on the road touring. But let me know in the comments below, what is your favorite game of 2022? Now, we're talking about one today that definitely made our top 10, and it's very high on the list of both of ours. Now, it's not my number one, but had I played it probably five, six, seven more times, it probably would jump, well, let me take that back. It would jump the one that I put as number one, possibly. Now, this is a great game. I'm telling you this right now ahead of time, so you can just look forward to the review and know that I'm giving this a glowing review, but I figured you probably knew that already if you already saw that video. So, question of the day, what is your favorite game of 2022? And you know what, I'm not as uh, much of a stickler on it. Let me know what game you played this year that you love the most. It could be The Colonist, it could be Viticulture, I don't care. Just let me know what in the comments below you loved this year in gaming. It could be a game that brought your family together, whatever it is. Because today we're talking about Endless Winter. Now, I've already told you that I love this game. No need to go any further about this. You're Paleo-Americans and you're trying to survive the cold. Uh, it's kind of like 10,000 BC, the movie. I started watching that the other day. It's an interesting movie. Uh, a lot of similar themes. So we're going to take a look at what Paleo Americans, sorry, Endless Winter does, how it plays, and some of the expansions. And we'll come up, talk from the thoughts right now. All right, so this is Endless Winter. Now, first of all, I want to show you the inside of the box for an important reason. One of my favorite things about gaming is when there's a nice insert, and this game does the inserts well. Everybody gets their player faction, kind of like the Scythe insert. Now, this comes with the game as opposed to having to buy it ahead of time with Scythe. Now, this is a tremendous insert. You have your little huts and your uh, monolith, megalith, whatever they call it. Yeah, megalith, because the other game's called monolith. I mix it up every time. Your starting deck, as well as your pieces under here. Like, this is a tremendous insert. And, oh my gosh, I highly recommend this. Now, you're going to pick your chieftain based on this ring. Uh, they have different powers based on who you pick, which is pretty cool. But, you have all these pieces, your workers, your huts, and then your big old communities there as well as your megalith tiles. And again, we'll talk about what those do in a minute. Again, this is not a like how to play. This is an overview of how to play. You have this track here. This is a worship track sort of deal where you're kind of honoring those who have died in your tribe because again, it's, a lot of people are going to die. It's tragic. And then over here, you're going to honor or count how many resources you have left at the end of the game. Now, the way this works is if you're in this range, it's four to one at the end of the game, three to one, two to one, one to one. So one point per work or food you have left over and this symbol anytime you see that symbol means you move up on this track i'll show you up close that's the one you want so it kind of mimics this symbol uh in a crude way but on purposely crude you're going to bury people here all that sort of stuff we'll talk about what that means in just a minute you have an animal track over here Based on player amount, you're going to put an animal deck here. And depending on if you're playing with the expansions or not, which we do love that uh, Ancestors expansion, it changes it. Uh, you put the deck of cards here, and then you're going to place animals out that are in the hunting grounds. And then you're going to potentially put more out and then hunt more and gain more. And these animals are awesome what they do. You also have a player board, a personal player board, which is a big win for us. You know that we like personal player boards. So you have your character here. Uh, it kind of goes based on the tribe, not so much the chieftain, because you're going to pick the chieftain card later. So <sighs> the art I haven't found to really matter based on the colors, obviously, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's in there and I'm just not seeing it. Uh, but you're going to track your food here. You're going to track your work here. And if you want to use food as work, you're going to back up your cube of food till you cross the next work. Now here, it's a lot more. Obviously, you have to move three backwards to get one work out of this. But if you move here, it's one to one, which is pretty great. Track your work there. You're going to put your sacred stones here. When you cover it, you get this benefit. Anytime you see the eclipse symbol, it means you get that benefit when you have it. Now, the cost of putting these out is based on here. So this sacred stone costs one work and one meat. And you also have to, um, I believe that's kill a card. Yeah, you have to, someone has to die. It's tragic, I know. But uh, that's what that means. So then this cost is one work, two food, one work, three food. And you're going to get these bonuses when you do them as well as whatever the sacred stone says during the eclipse phases, which happens quite a lot. So it's nice. Yes, I just got an Amazon package. You heard that. So... 
You're going to have your huts here, those round ones that start the game. They're going to sit on your player board right there. And then you're going to have your megalith tiles right here. Now, when you uncover them, you're going to start to get the benefits during the eclipse phase. So if you've moved this, you get a card. If you've moved this, you get a work. Uh, you get a you know a, tr a track movement. That's what that does. So essentially, that's kind of your main player board. Now, I'm going to show you this here. And again, I'm not going to build the whole board out. I just don't think it's necessary because what I'm going to show you right here kind of shows you everything. This is the main board. Now, it is a worker placement game. You have three workers. You have your two action workers and your chief. Your chief will give you a power when you use the chief. And we'll talk about those in a minute. This eclipse phase over here is also the turn track. If you're the highest, you get a megalith, which we'll show you that sideboard in just a moment. Uh, you kind of build it out every game. Depending on how you want to do it, you can change the shape of it. Then you have your sacred stones during era one. You can build from here, era two here, and then three you can build from here and four as well. As well as the cultural cards. The cultural cards, there's going to be a whole lot of cards below here that are going to change too. Some of them be cultural cards, some of them be tribe cards. You're going to have one of each type of tribe card here and they all do different benefits and again if you're playing with the ancestor variant you'll know that that, that you can change those out or you can kind of mix and match but essentially this is the meat of the board because you've got your points tracker on the outside but most importantly are the four actions right here now these correspond to the tribes people because typically they'll say if you do this action you get this and i'll show you those cards in just a moment again i'm not setting the whole game up i don't think you need it for this overview now, what's great is in the rule book, there's an explanation for all of these kind of born out. So you see it's kind of broken down here, and this is what it does. You can do the top part infinite times, you can do the second part one time, and then the bottom part if you're the first there. So that's you see, you can do this top part as many times as you want, second part one time, and third part as many times, or excuse me, if you're the first there. So what they do is listed right here in the rule book. So number one, in the top section, you can spend a tool and a labor to take one of the face-up tribe cards from below the main board into your hand. If you use this action multiple times on the same turn, because you can, you would have to take two different types. See, that's what that symbol means there. And once you can spend a food to, put our handy little notebook out here, you can take one of the face-up tribe cards from below the main board and place it into your discard pile, and then you can bury a card. Now, burying a card means you put it under your player board down here in the burial slot. When you do that, at the end of the game, you're gonna count those for points based on this track. The more cards you have buried based on this at the top, the more points you get at the end of the game. So there's a benefit to burying cards, especially the weaker ones, but there's also a benefit to bury a lot. Now, over here, develop. You're going to spend three work to gain one of the cultural cards. Now, the cultural cards are phenomenal. I'll show you those in a minute. They really benefit you, and you can play them before your turn to really boost your turn. Then you have, down here, you can spend a food and a tool to get a sacred stone. Now that's based on your player board like we talked about. So depending on the price of the sacred stone spot, you'll do that. Over here, you spend a tool to place down a hut. Now that's one of the little TP things in your hut thing. Then you're gonna place a, spend a, as again, as many times as you want, you can do that. And then you're gonna spend a work to move it. Now why you would move it, we'll show you on the main, not the main board, there is no main board. That's what's weird about this. So you have this, this main board, quote unquote, but you have the area control board and then you have your personal player boards and then you have the food board and the animal board and the, the tribal board. But at the end, if you're the first one to go here, you're going to get to place and move another one. And the reason you want to do that is because if you control an area, you get its benefit. The other thing you can do is once per turn, if you take this action, spend three food to take three of your touching huts and make them into one of these colonies right here. Then over here for the animal track, you can spend a work to put two new animals out there. And again, it is based on a player count. However, you can have more than the player count, but it's never going to refill more than the player count. Then here you can spend a tool and a work to gain one of those animals. And then down here, once you can tap an animal, I don't, that's not the right term because they'll be angry about that at uh, Wizards of the Coast, but you can turn an animal on its side to get its benefit. And however, if you turn it on its side like this, you cannot use it if you hunt an animal. You can't use it for, at the end of the game for the set collection, which is important because you want to have more animals of different sets to get more points. And then if you're the first one there, you can just draw a random animal card. So that's the main board. Now let's talk about the area control board. So you have these tiles that are gonna be set up on the board. Some of them are just glaciers, which are nothing. Not like the WCW wrestler, he was awesome and I disagree with anybody who thinks he wasn't, even though he was past his prime in Mortal Kombat. But you have these areas here, so if you control these tiles by having the most power in them, a hut counts as one, 
um, a settlement, the one with the big plastic piece counts as two per one it touches because you're going to put them in the corner. See how these make a circle here? You're going to put them right there on the corner. You'll get two here, two here, and two there. If you control this, you will gain this during the eclipse for that one's two meet. During the eclipse, you'll gain two points. During the eclipse, you'll gain a megalith tile. So all sorts of area control bonuses. This is not the main game, though, even though it looks like the main game. And then you have this megalith section over here. And again, this is a table eater. Now, that's the only downside is you think there's not a lot in here, but you're going to place these out based on how you want. And there's a couple different configurations. I typically just do the uh, boom, 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 boom like this. So what happens is you have to place the first ones in this main, this first section here, this gray section. Then you have to build adjacent to one that's already there. It doesn't have to be yours. And when you cover these, you're going to get the bonus, but you're also going to get points when you place them out if you place them on top of others. So if you place, it's kind of like Teotihuacan in that sense that you're going to place them out. And then as you place on top of these, a four set of four, you're going to place one on top of there. You're going to get the points for everything below it. You don't get the bonuses again, but each of these bonuses are thematic. So you won't play with every one of them every time like the um, expansion says. So that's what this is. This is the megalith tiles. That's where those go. Last but not least, I want to show you the cards. So these are the different tribes here. You have your hunter tribe, right? That's why it's got that. You have your pathfinder, your crafter, your elder, and then in this one, the shaman. Now, what these do is when you use them ahead of time during the game, if you play them, you can use them for work during your turn, or you can hold them to where you have the highest amount of work. And if you have the highest amount of work, you get a bonus during the uh, during the eclipse phase, which is always good to have a bonus during the eclipse phase. During the eclipse phase, during the turn. So if you went to the hunter action and you played this card to boost it, you would get an additional work. So this would count as two work. Again, it's it's a lot to take in, but the work is, is kind of a uh, deck builder system where you don't use it unless you... Uh, you lose it if you don't use it, I should say. You don't get to carry over work till the next turn. So that's what that is. Let me focus that camera. Sorry. Work with a different lens than normal. Here, same thing. You When you take that action, you get an additional work, and then also you get the bonus during the Eclipse if you have this played in your Eclipse stack. And what you do is during the Eclipse, you can set a stack for the Eclipse to basically boost your actions during the Eclipse. You're going to get the highest amount of work. It means you get to pick first on the, or you go first on that benefits thing, which will give you a Megalith first, and then it kind of moves down. But also, you can always take a lesser benefit. If you don't want the Megalith, you can take whatever benefit is below it. Then you have the uh, crafter here, same kind of thing. When you do that, get a bonus work here. And they all essentially do the same thing. They're going to give you bonus. Now, the culture cards, these are a little different. You're going to start with one, but what happens is they're going to boost you. So when you destroy a card, you're going to uh, put an animal out and gain an animal and gain a point. You know, these are all cultural level two, so you wouldn't be able to play these till turn three and four. But cultural level ones are still good too. You know, they're just benefits. Spend a, a food to tap an animal and then bury a card and then gain a point. Like all these things are good. They go spears. You can play this. When it comes into your hand, you're going to play this and gain three tools, which is just invaluable during the game. So culture cards are such a boon and a boost. Now let's talk about the chieftain cards. Now they're two-sided because you get to pick essentially which side you want to play as. You want this side or this side. When you take this action with the chief, do that. When you take this action with the chief, do that. And then it's the same thing, just a little different on both sides. You kind of get to pick your chief and then pick which side you want. The chiefs here are nice miniatures. They're chunky miniatures of those kind of characters that we're so used to in these type of games. They look really, really good. But that's what they do. There are solo rules in here, but that is the main overview of how to play this game. You're putting your actions out. You're doing the actions. You're playing the cards to boost those actions. You can hold off to the... Um, Eclipse to help get a bonus then, but really and truly just a solid game inside of here. So that's Endless Winter. So first of all, let's talk art. As we do, when I break down games, I do art, then how it goes to art direction and how that bleeds into gameplay. See how those flow into each other, almost like a flow chart or a uh, Venn diagram, you know, this, this, this. Art in this game is tremendous. It's the Garp Hill art that you're familiar with, with the Raiders of the North Sea, Architects of the West Kingdom. It's that similar art style. Now, I don't know if, I'm pretty sure, now don't quote me, because you can correct me, obviously. It's YouTube, so you can and will. Uh, I don't know if it's the exact same artist, but it looks like the art from those games, and I love that style. It's a 
seriousness to it, but also a silliness to it at the same time. Like it's not like chibi art where it's like cute and cutesy. It's a serious style with a cartoony form. So I don't know, uh, but I love the art. Now the art direction of this game is tremendous because so many times in this game, there are symbols that just make sense once you know them. Now granted, there's a little bit like someone needs to know the game, right? And teach the game, obviously. But once you get it, you get it. You know that this gives you this and this does this or this cost this and this cost that. It's so easy to follow what you do. I also love how in the art direction of the game, you do the top action, the second action, and the bottom action. And if you're the first one there, you get the best action. If you're the second one there, well, you don't get that bottom action. But seeing the top and you can do this once, you can do this as many times as you want, like it's clearly there on the board. So even though the board doesn't look like some uh, 10,000 BC ice scape painting, it's got some of that there and it's got these charts and these tracks and it just looks good. Now, as far as the tracks go themselves, first of all, I love a game with tracks. Think Zolkin, think things like that where you have tracks that you're moving up on. Zolkin, uh, Teotihuacan, whatever. I have a hard time with that one. South Alabama, Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is what we call it down here. Hey, boy. Anyway, it is a three track system. You have the, or two track system, which are moving up this side for people you've not killed, but they've died and you're honoring them. Or this side for the side that you're honoring how many not honoring, but you're keeping track of how many resources you have, which makes sense thematically, right? So you have the tracks that you're moving up, and then you have the game that you're trying to play, you have your tableau that you're building, you have your cards, your deck that you're building. So art and art direction is a plus. Like, it's a huge win for this game. I love how this game looks, and I love how the game's look plays into how the game plays. Now, let's talk about how the game plays. This is one of my favorite worker placement games of all time. Like... It made number three on my list, I think, and maybe number two or three on Carla's list. It is such a good game. Now, let me just explain this. If I were to do my top 100 again over, this would be in the top five, possibly. Like, I love this game with the expansions. We've played all but the river, and every one of them is good. Every one of them is valid and useful. I really, 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 really like the cave paintings. I would not play the cave paintings with four people who take a long time to play. Only because, yes, you can do it during you know someone else's turn and be like, oh, I'm doing my cave paintings. But there's still a little bit of a delay and a disconnect from, oh, here's the main game. Here's my game over here. So you kind of have that aspect of it where you're like, okay, well, let me unfocus from the main board for a minute. Let me do my board over here. So there's that downside. However, the fact that you have your own board with your resources, I love how you track resources. Let, let me get this out of the gate. I love Uwe Rosenberg, right? I loved Caverna. However, when Hammer Tau came out and some of the other ones, uh, oh, what's the two-player game? It's going to take me a minute. Field of Arl. Arla. Arl? Arla. I don't know. Did a review about that at the old house, and it was fun. Two characters of me playing the same one. I have gotten maybe old and grouchy in my gaming. I don't want to grab 10 wheat or 10 gold or 10 brick. I want to have a track that says you have 10 of fish or 10 food and 10 of this. Like I want to track now and I want to be able to track it with that. So having the glass cube or the you know the clear blue cube to track what you have to me is a win. Uh, I love that there are so few resources to collect. There's you, know, you have work and you have food and you can substitute food for work and all that stuff. I love that the cards you play, whether they be uh, um, uh, what is the word? I can't think of it but anyway. You play it like the cultural card, you know, you play that ahead of your turn and then you play the cards on your turn or you could say you know what I'm gonna hold these cards till the uh, eclipse phase because man like those are so good how about that you got tracks and eclipse in one game I'm sensing a little bit of love for some Zolkin and Teotihuacan right anyway I love how this game plays it is a near perfect game I never say a game's perfect because I'm sure somebody can say well what about this what about this and I'll be like yeah you're probably right this is a 9 out of 10 I love this game like I will play this for the rest of time like this isn't one of those games that I give a high review and then someone comes to me later you know two three four five years later at this point and says hey you like that game don't you and be like oh yeah I hadn't played that in a while this is a game that's going to hit our rotation very often now, Carl and I play games all the time the two of us here at the house um this is one that's going to be very high on the list so if you haven't played Endless Winter yet go out of your way Go buy this game. It is the best Euro game that I've played in years. It is so good. Now, Mosaic made my top number one of the year, and it is a tremendous game. I'm going to give it its praise, too. 
Now, had I played both of them probably the same amount of times I played Endless Winter at this point, I'm wondering if my top 10 list would have changed for the year. I don't know that, but I'm just saying. Mosaic is a great game. A great game, as MJF would say. But Endless Winter is one of the best games I've ever played. So is Mosaic. But if you like Euros, if you like worker placement, if you like hand management, if you like tableau building, if you like deck building, go get this game. The fact that there's the animals that you can hunt and be like, well, I kind of want to save them for the points at the end, but man, that bonus is good. Yes, it's a point salad game, but there are so many choices on your turn and every single one of those choices is good because you can be like, well, I can do this to do this or I can do this to do this. My gosh, is this a good game. I can't say enough good things about it. Endless Winter, 9 out of 10, is a almost perfect game. I'd, I'd probably give it a 9.5 if I even did that. I don't really do 9.5s often because it's like, well, what's the point? Why not just give it a 10 out of 10 if you're doing 9.5? This is a 9 out of 10. Beautiful game. Beautiful art direction. Fun to play. It is tremendous. Go get Endless Winter right now. Like Literally, while you're doing this, pop up Amazon or go to your local game store, FLGS, your friendly local game store. Let's be honest, some of them aren't friendly, so we'll just do the LGS. Go get that game right now and play it and let me know what you think because Endless Winter is a bananas game. It's so stinking good. So I'm Brian Drake here on the Dice Tower. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, etc. at Dice Tower Brian. And uh, we'll see you on the cruise in like two weeks. Oh my gosh. We're like two and a half weeks away from the cruise. So come game with me. Let's play Endless Winter together. I would love to play that or Scythe or any of the ones that are on my top 100. You know I'd love to play uh, Western Legend with you. So if you grab that and say, Brian, can you teach this? Can you play it? I'm in. Or Twilight Imperium. So I love those games. Mansions of Madness as well. So make sure to find me. Find me on the cruise. Find Carl on the cruise. We would love to play those games with you. Well, she wouldn't love to play Western Legends as much as I would, but tremendous. So... That is all I have to say about Endless Winter. 9 out of 10. Beautiful game. Fun game. Awesome game. Go get it right now. I'm Brian Drake. Dice Tower Brian. We'll see you.